All right. So I'm going to get started. Uh, so looking at the schedule, I adjusted kind of the schedule based on uh, what we covered last week. So we'll more or less sort of work on here sort of today and probably bleed into Thursday. That will kind of wrap up the topics that we'll cover for our second midterm next Tuesday. So it'll be pretty much just all our new material is what I'm going to talk about. It's going to be between first and second midterm that we'll cover next week. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, homework five is posted. First couple of problems uh, you could uh, solve based on the flexure information we covered last week. Uh, the last couple problems will be the material this week. Since uh, some of that material we'll cover on Thursday this week, I did adjust the due date for homework five. Uh, it is not Thursday at midnight. I think I had this, this Saturday. Okay. So you've got a couple more days for that. Um, but the Saturday at midnight will be kind of, uh, well, I'll say Sunday at 8 a.m. will be kind of the hard sort of uh, deadline for that because I do want to post the solution. So you have the solution for the homework for the midterm. Um, so uh, there won't be late homework accepted beyond the single homework there. Also in reference to midterm two, I did post a sample uh, midterm. Uh, it's kind of like last time. It's sample problems like you might encounter on a midterm. It's not intended to be the same length as midterm. It's probably longer than the exam you will have. But if you just wanted to Look at some more problems to, to practice uh, that's available. So uh, I guess let me pause a little bit since we did have a little interruption last week with me being out on Thursday. Before we jump into new material, are there some lingering questions that would be good to talk about before we jump into the new material. Yeah. We were looking at the supply and Yeah. Yeah, so excellent question. Uh, I mean, I think the big concept, uh, the general stress equation we have, I'm working there. Uh, bending stress is equal to negative my over i, and that is sort of iz, so that would be sort of mz. That's for a sort of generic coordinate system that has your y-axis here and your z-axis here, the sort of x-axis is your longitudinal axis. And so if you have that specific coordinate system, then that works out exactly. And the reason why the negative sign there is for a positive moment about the z-axis, if you go in the positive y direction, you're going to have a compressive stress, which is negative, hence the negative sign. So more or less this positive or negative in front of the my over i component is just saying, if you go to the, uh, you know, in a, in a given direction, are you going to have a compressive or tensile stress, and then the sign positive or negative associated with that. In my experience, uh, you know, I use lots of different software packages. I use a lot of hand calcs. I look at lots of different textbooks. And with different textbooks, different software packages, it's not uncommon that they have different coordinate systems that they use. 
that they don't always have the I, Y, and I, Z in this direction like the textbook is using. And so I've kind of, my general practice is because I'm sort of always jumping between these, that I just assign the sign directly myself. And so I just say, okay, I've got some generic um, cross-section and I like to break my moments down into um, their Cartesian directions. So I say, okay, let's say I've got a, a moment in this direction and a moment in this direction. And then I want to check what the stress is right there. Well, so I just break that into the two components. I say, okay, let me look at first moment, and so first moment there, point your thumb in the direction of the arrow, fingers curl to the compressive side, <laughs> so this whole top half is in compression, and the component to that is going to be your uh, my over i is the magnitude at that location with this being your y. And then I look separately at the second condition that I say, okay, second condition is I've got this moment down here. This moment down here, I point that from in the direction. The compression is on that side. So this whole side of my member is in compression. And so this here is intention. The magnitude of it is going to be my myz over iy component. And so then if I have these two cases, I'm looking in that corner, I've got a negative stress com from compression and a positive stress for tension. And I just add them together that way. So that's kind of my general um, practice that I use just because coordinate systems change and that's just using the basic my over i concept. Um, but for the problems in the textbook, they are consistent with having the uh, unsymmetric bedding problem with the same coordinate system. And so for the textbook problems, you can plug and chug into that equation that has the embedded signs. Yes. Yeah, the, the positive or negative that falls into this equation it's just saying compression and tension based on a given direction. That's all the sort of positive negative is there. Uh, that's specific to the coordinate system it has, but um, I think that's a little bit, uh, based on my personality, everybody's got you know, different comfort levels and uh, common mistakes that they make. And for me, I'm more likely to make a mistake just blindly following a equation with pluses and minuses um, because then maybe I don't plug in a negative y when I should and get it wrong versus if I just draw a little figure and I see here's compression, here's tension, and I know what to add them together, then that's more straightforward for me. But what's more straightforward for me is maybe not what's straightforward for you. So I tried to present both, both options. Other questions? Okay. So, um, you know, we've been talking about bending stresses, and just to make sure that we remember that bending stresses, when you've got your, your beam member, you've got some bending associated with it, or then 
sectioning through our member and looking at those stresses on that cross section. And these bending stresses, these sigmas, are normal stresses that are perpendicular to that longitudinal axis. And we just have a neutral axis where there's no bending, or no deformation, and we've got compression on one side and tension on the other. So now we're going to start to talk about shear. So where's shear at on this cross section? It's in the plane, right? So instead of being perpendicular stress that you've got some, some loading occurring, the section, you're looking at how the stresses are here, the stresses are going to be in that plane in the cross section. And so that's what we're going to talk about with chapter 7. So our objectives here, that first one, a sketch how shear forces vary across a cross section. So the first one is that they're in the plane, so the direction of them is going to be in that vertical plane of our cross section. And we'll look at the equation here shortly, but the shear stresses, if we look at the magnitude of our shear stresses on that cross section, they're not going to be the same. So they're going to vary. They're going to be zero uh, at the outer edges, and they're going to be the maximum see in a little bit why that is the case. The biggest challenge, I think, with plugging into the equation for shear is this next term. The general shear equation is just resultant shear times Q all over moment of inertia times Thickness of member. So internal resultant, find that either via sectioning the member, falling forward directly at a given location, or more commonly, do your shear diagram, where you're looking at the sort of max value of shear is the max shear. Moment of inertia, it's the same moment of inertia we've been dealing with fitting stresses, so that's straightforward. P is just the cross-section thickness, so whatever those shear stresses are, they're going to be spread over that thickness. And those are all kind of relatively straightforward, and I think students generally are less, uh, making fewer mistakes with those three terms. This um, fourth component, Q, it's a new term, uh, so we'll talk about that shortly, but it varies constantly over the cross-section. So Q is kind of a function, and it depends on where you are on that cross-section. So there's not, it's not a material property, it's not a cross-sectional property. It's specific on where you at on that cross-section, and then compute the value. So that's a, a little more difficult, I think, for students to wrap their mind around, so we're going to spend a lot of time today trying to calculate various values for Q. We're then going to be plugging into this basic equation, calculate shear stresses on a cross section. And then the last one, determine required connections uh, for built-up beams. And so built-up beams for, oops, for example, Let's say you've got a beam that has, it's comprised of multiple components. So here you've got a top wooden beam that's been nailed to two side members. And in order for those to act compositely as one cross section, we have to provide for sufficient shear strength at those connections. So that's what we're going to be looking at with shear flow is how we calculate both what the loads on those connectors are and then check their strength. So those are our four learning objectives. We 
the next sort of couple minutes here, we'll talk about the basic sort of derivation. The derivation is just in your notes, so you can kind of sit back and try and digest it. So we've got some basic assumptions. The assumptions are more or less the same as what we have for our bending flexure formula. So straight and pris prismatic, um, homogeneous, the so same material. The shear acts along the axis of symmetry of the section. Linear elastic Hooke's law. Um, so those are our basic assumptions that we come up with. And the first critical thing in order to digest the derivation that comes up with our VQ over IT equation is back from chapter one when we started talking about stresses. We were talking about, okay, we've got, you know, we section a member, we look at stresses on the cut plane, shear stresses are in that plane. We talked about, well, if we've got a a you know, little differential element right there, and we look at a blow up of it in 2Ds like this. So we're just kind of blowing up that member there. If we have shear that is down on one side of our differential element, we have to satisfy some of forces in the y direction equal to zero based on equilibrium. And so that is why we have shear that's up on the opposite side. But that moment or that equation of equilibrium is satisfied. But if we look at moment on that differential element, right now it wants to rotate on one side, down the other, it's got a moment about it. And so those shear stresses that are on one face always cause what we call a complementary shear stress on the longitudinal face that's equal in magnitude. And so um, you know, those are equal in magnitude sort of shear stresses and they just balance out that moment so that the cross-section doesn't rotate. That's important because the derivation we're going to look at, we're going to be looking at these longitudinal shear stresses to come up with our equation. And we know from this basic property that if we can solve for this, then it's going to be equal to the magnitude on the actual cut face. I think this can be a little difficult to um, conceptualize sometime. Let's see if I can show this a little bit. But so if this is my beam member. For it to be acting as one cohesive unit, it's got to be fully bonded on all those layers. And if I've got sort of a fixed support here and start to apply a downward pressure, I need to make that bigger, don't I? I don't want to hide. No. There we go. There we go. It's doing the tracking thing on my head. All right, I'm going to hold it up here in my head. Okay. It's trying to hide me. Um, do you see how uh, when I start on, on this unconnected end on the right? Yeah, I wonder if it would be easier. Can I get a volunteer? Maybe someone to hold it? Sure, come on up here. Yeah, that's what I'm going to try and do too. Uh, where's my... 
Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Where's this at here? Can I just the the tracking thing? Uh, uh, no, you're going to apply the force. Down one? Uh, yeah. So just just hold it. Uh, hold it just uh, horizontal first, so they're not like layered apart. So, can you see that the edge over here is relatively vertical? They're stacked pretty neatly. And now I'm going to hold it, and you just push it down. I don't know if you can um, can see see how they're not stacked neatly on the edge, and so the reason why they're not stacked neatly is that these surfaces here were not bound together. Like 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 right now, oh, right now um, it's just friction that's sort of holding them. But if you just uh, if just a small shear force is applied, that friction is probably sufficient to bond those layers together in shear. But if the shear force exceeds that friction force, then um, we actually get sliding shear failure along these planes. And that's why these ends of the member then are not stacked, because they're actually sliding relative to one another. You know, in the extreme sense, they're, they're sliding like that. I don't know if that sort of makes sense, but that was intended to be kind of a little visual demonstration. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was intended to be a little visual demonstration, just trying to sort of uh, illustrate those, those longitudinal shear stresses, or actually it would be in that direction, um, how they sort of come into play in our memory. Okay, let's see if we can get back to it. So, we're talking about those longitudinal shear stresses. So the basic derivation, you've got some member under load, you take a differential, uh, differential element, we blow it up, and for whatever reason, this, um, the book, gives this as the cross-section this little egg-shaped cross-section. Just trying to say, oh, it could be any sort of arbitrary shape. And you've got your centroid of your cross-section right there. You know, this here is the, the neutral axis. And so on one side of your cross-section, you've got you know, bending stresses. On the other side, you've got bending stresses. And what we're going to do, you know, that, that element that is that egg-shaped cross-section, we're going to slice through and look at just that top piece, what the stresses that remain are. Slice through and look at what are the stresses that exist on that element just on that top piece. So kind of slicing through and then looking at that. And what we have got bending stresses, bending stresses, those are acting, you know, longitudinal to the face, and I guess these are compressive stresses, so we've got compressive longitudinal stress, compressive longitudinal stress, and if your moments are different, those compressive stresses are going to be different. So right now, sum of forces in the x equal to zero is not satisfied. 
unless, all right, I should say without tau. Not satisfied just based on the sigma stress. The only thing that's going to satisfy it is adding in that shear stress that's happening on that bottom longitudinal surface. So that's the big sort of takeaway. You take that sum of forces in the x, you've got your stresses and your areas, the normal stresses. That's where we know from last week that the normal stresses can be um, denoted as moments times y over i. So that substitution happens into those equations. So we've got stress, sub in my over i, integrate over the area, rearrange terms, and that's where we get down here. That shear stress is equal to one over moment inertia and thickness of member, dm dx, that's slope of the moment diagram, which our discussion on moment and shear diagrams, we know that the slope of the moment diagram is equal to shear. And then we've got integral of y dA. And so that is known as the first moment of area. And that is equal to Q. So that's how we then sort of sum in and plug into this equation and have that dt of y for our shear stress. So I think the important thing here is certainly being able to apply this equation and understanding that concept that the way that we actually get that is that we're looking at these longitudinal shear stresses between layers of our member. And because of the normal stresses that we're applying on the ends of our members due to bending, that if we didn't have shear holding these members together, they would just shear off. And so it's that shear stress that's holding those members from shearing off that way. And due to the complementary property, these longitudinal shear stresses here are the same as the face shear stresses here. The Q, um, again, this is the sort of most mistakes happen calculating Q. And so in the notes here, I've tried to sort of highlight that in lecture. You know, maybe you want to rewrite this equation. Tau is equal to V Q of Y I T to sort of highlight that this is not a material cross-sectional property, it's not constant. It varies everywhere on your cross-section. Um, and that's because when we look at this equation, tau equals dq over it, moment of inertia is a cross-sectional property, so it's constant. If we're looking at a given location on our member, we've got a member that's under load, Let's just look at a simple, simple case where we've got a couple loads on our member, and we end up with some reactions there. We're then going to have a shear diagram. A shear diagram is going to jump up, slope down. Constant over, point load, you know, whatever the magnitude is, it's general shape there. That's what we have. And so if, for example, you know, 
this is our max V that we plug in to that equation. It doesn't matter if we're looking at the stress at the top, stress at the middle, stress at the bottom. That V is constant at that specific location. It doesn't vary. For a beam like this that has constant thickness, that T is the same everywhere. So the only component in that equation that would actually produce a different shear value depending on where you are on the cross section is Q. And I've said that you know the shear stress varies uh, constantly across the cross section, um, and so that means that that Q is unique everywhere on that cross section. So Q, that basic expression was integral of Y dA. We're generally dealing with shapes that we can break up into sort of rectangles or triangles. So we can look at that as summation of Y prime times A prime. Does that look familiar from another term that we've calculated? Where have we seen Y prime and A prime? Not quite moment of inertia. What do we calculate before moment of inertia? Centroid. Yeah, so centroid, you know, if we're calculating y bar, the general form of that equation is summation of, you know, y prime times a prime all over summation of a prime. So, this numerator is what Q is. So not dividing by a summation of area, but it's, but it's very similar. So that this numerator that we use to calculate centroid is that first moment of area. When we're calculating Q, we first have already calculated centroid. So we know the centroid location, that centroid location defines the neutral axis. So these y terms that come into that equation are the distance from the neutral axis, distance from the centroid to the location. So we're going to practice applying all these here shortly. So basic procedure to plug into that shear stress equation, determine what your V, your shear stress is, or shear force is, excuse me. Sectional properties, you need to calculate centroid, that tells you your neutral axis, you need to calculate moment of inertia. And then we're going to have to calculate Q. Um, Q is specific to where you are on that cross section. And to try and reinforce that um, this is a, a quantity you're calculating in a specific location. We've got a cross section look at some generic cross section here let's say this is my my cross section the inspection my centroid is going to be somewhere around here and if I want to know what the uh, shear stress is on the bottom of that flange, to calculate Q, you have to identify the region where you're evaluating the shear stress. And 
when you're calculating Q, which is that first molar of area, which is the area from the outer edge to that point you're evaluating the stress at. So outer edge here, and you're including all the area from the outer edge to that location where you're evaluating the stress. So that hatched area there, that is our A prime we're going to use for Q. This here would be the, the Y prime. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, are there any any questions on that before we jump into some examples? Go back to that previous slide, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I hesitate whether or not I wanted to mention it right now, but since you brought it up, I will. So on this cross section, I'm going to redraw it right here. So same cross section. Here's my centroid. Here's my location that I'm wanting to establish tau. So to calculate Q, you include the entire area from outer edge to that specific location. Outer edge can either be top edge or bottom edge. So what I did in the first diagram there is I was calculating what I'm calling Q top which is just using the outer top edge, going down through my cross section until I get to the point of interest. And then that whole area is what I'm using to calculate it. However, I could do the same thing going from the outer edge here. And then I would include this whole area The centroid of that hatched area would be here. This here would be my Y prime. You know, that hatched area there, that's my A prime. And at any given location in your cross section, it doesn't matter if you choose method one going from the top or method two going from the bottom. The value you get for Q is always the same. Yes. Yeah, it's that um, Y bar prime here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, let's see here. So, uh, yeah. So the, the bar indicates it's the centroid of the area you're using for calculating Q versus Y prime is just So, uh, to be consistent there, this, this here would be the Y prime. Okay, so 
that answers that sort of question there as, for, as far as the Q top or Q bottom. Um, and then start to introduce the procedure that we're going to use to calculate that Q. The rest of the components there we should be able to evaluate. Calculate. So let's start with a sample that's going to reinforce all these components. So we've got this railroad tie. It has these pair of 34 kip loads being applied to the rails, and that's going to be distributed into the ground, into the soil underneath that railroad tie the uniform distribution. We've got dimensions as far as we've got a one half foot overhang to the first tie, three feet span to the next tie, one and a half foot overhang. This here is the cross section of the tie, it's eight inches wide and six inches tall. So we want to determine first find W with this being W what's that uniform load that's going to be applied at the soil resisting those pair of reactions then we want to find our max shear location on that tie and then we want to calculate shear stress this is at section AA and so that means we need to calculate uh, first centroid, then moment of inertia, then Q, and then plug into EQ over IT. So that's a basic procedure. How are we going to accomplish step one? Yeah, that's just going to be summation of forces in the y direction. So, should be able to go ahead and jump in, calculate that. Once you have that magnitude of W, then you've got your load diagram that's complete. You should be able to plot your shear diagram. So let's take a couple minutes. Uh, I'll let you work through that. I'll wander around. Any questions? Anyone need to sign in?
Where's the centroid at? Yeah, so for shapes like this, you can just be an inspection, you know, it's just, just rectangles. So it's just going to be right in the middle of the centroid. That's where your centroid is. And what's our equation for moment of inertia of a uh, rectangle? pH cubed over 12. This one is saying that we're calculating the maximum shear stresses. So the maximum shear stress always includes the minimum shear stress. So we just draw a horizontal line through the neutral axis. And then we, for Q, we either need to calculate Q top or Q bottom, because all the area on one side. So the, uh, I made this comment up here, I'm going to put it down first. So this question is asking uh, for the max shear stress. So max shear stress always, whoops, not two bills, always occurs at the neutral axis. So neutral axis is at the centroid. So that's where our shear stress is going to be maximum. And so what I like to do, I just draw a horizontal line through the location where I'm evaluating the shear stress. And then to calculate Q, you're either doing all the area on one side or the other side. So you can either do all the area on top or all the area on the bottom. Calculate. Yes. I've written down that Q is just measuring the YRI on the area of the centroid. Mm -hmm. And YR prime is the difference or the, the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid area. Of the number, number. Yep. Let's figure it out. There you go. That's going to fill in zero. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, start jumping through the first couple steps. Sounds like most people have gotten some progress there. And then we'll look at Q together if we're still struggling with that. So, if we look at... Uh, Summation of forces in the Y equal to zero. That's minus 34 kips times two loads at the rail. And that's resisted by W. W is in the positive direction, so plus W times its length. Length is six feet total. Those are all the forces, so it's got to be equal to zero. So W is equal to 11.3 kips per foot. So 
So if I redraw my little diagram here, 34 kips, 34 kips, uniform load of 11.3 kips per foot. And I want to create a shear diagram. What's the shear diagram going to do on the left edge? So it's equal to magnitude of W and a sine of W. W in this case is inverted from what we normally have. But yes, it's going to slope up 11.3. 11.3 times 1.5 feet gets us to a value of 17 kips. Then we've got a vertical drop. That vertical drop is equal to the magnitude of that force, 34 kips. So that takes us to minus 17 kips. And then same thing, we've got our sloped uniform load, so 1.3 kips per foot. Gets us back there to a value of 17 kips. Drops back down. So we've got some symmetry there on our diagram. And so the problem specifically was, you know, asking it this section AA location right there, evaluate shear stress. But in general, as a practitioner, what you'd like to have on exam is some sort of problem like this where you've got some sort of loading, you've got to create your salt for your reactions, you create your flow diagram, draw your shear diagram. And then we're in, generally interested in shear stresses where they're maximum. So we, then we just take the max shear stress from our shear force diagram, plug that into our equation. So my cross section. I've got dimensions here. This is eight inches wide. This is six inches tall. Centroid being inspections is right there in the middle because it's a rectangle. Moment of inertia, we said is BH cubed over 12. We're bending about that horizontal axis. to that axis we're bending about. So VH cubed over 12, that is eight inches times six inches cubed over 12, which is 144 cubic inches, excuse me, not cubic, inches to the fourth. So for our equation for tau, VQ over IT, we've got V, we've got I, what's T going to be? Eight inches in this case because our thickness of our member is constant throughout and we're looking at maximum so we're evaluating shear stress at the neutral axis. We need to calculate Q. Correct. Yep, we'll look at the I-beam next. So to calculate Q, um, I always just draw horizontal line at the location we're evaluating shear stress. 
and then you need to include all the area on either side and only on the one side. So we can either use top or bottom. In this case, it's a rectangle, so it's kind of arbitrary. So I'm just going to go ahead and do the top. So where is my Y bar prime at? I hear 1.5. What's 1.5 from what? Yeah, so that hex area, that's my A prime. And so I go to the centroid of that hatched area. And then that distance from the overall cross section centroid to that centroid of the hatched area, that is my Y bar prime. That hatched area, that is my A prime. So, Q is going to be equal to no, that's not good. area is eight inches times three inches. Oops, not equals. So that's my area component times my y bar prime. Y bar prime half the thickness of the top, which is one point five inches. The Q is 36 inches cubed. So then we can plug those values into the equation. 17 kips, 36 inches cubed, 144 inches to the fourth, eight inches. And we get that was 0 0.531 KSI. Yeah, for cross-sectional stresses in the uh, English system, it's pretty much always per square inch. Questions about that? So, uh, we evaluated there at the neutral axis. What is uh, the shear stress at the top edge is going to be. Zero. And zero, why? Yeah, Q is zero. Because in order to calculate Q, you've got to have an area. But if you've not moved any you don't have any area of your member, it's, it's zero. So shear stress right here, tau equals zero. We've got tau at the neutral axis, 0 0.531 KSI. What about if we wanted to evaluate tau right there? We wanted to do that, so we're going to evaluate tau right here. This is 1.5 inches. So what are my terms for Q? Yeah, so that 
a top centroid there. This is going to be my y bar prime. So y bar prime, that's going to be 2.25 inches. And area top, that's going to be 8 inches times 1.5 inches. So 12 inches, right? So 12 square inches. That's the quick notation. Uh, so Q is going to be equal to 12 square inches times 2.25 inches. Twenty seven inches cubed. So tau twenty seven over thirty six, that's seventy five percent, right? All right, just for fun. I said Q top and Q bottom are the same, right? Calculate Q bottom here. So Q bottom, the area is a lot bigger, right? A bottom, but Y bar is a lot smaller, right? What is Y bar? You got uh, 4.5 divided by 2, 2.25, 0 0.75. The bottom is um, 8 inches times 4.5 inches. What is that? That's 36. So Q bottom is equal to 36 square inches times 0 0.75 inches equal to 27 inches cubed. So it's something that sometimes intuitively just looking at it doesn't seem likely because the area is, wow, that's grossly different. How can that be the same value? But because they're proportional. This one area is bigger, the Y is smaller, or vice versa. Smaller area, bigger Y. So that's a procedure for calculating. Okay, let's take a break there, 11.15. Let's come back at 11.20. Work on the next topic. All right, so I'll make one more... Uh, a little comment here on this problem before we move to our next example. So we just uh, evaluated shear stress at three locations. We evaluated shear stress at the top, it was zero. The shear stress halfway from the top to neutral axis, it was 0.398. Shear stress at the neutral axis, 0.53. So if we were to plot those, tau, if this is your neutral axis location, that would plot just like a curve like that. You always have zero at the top, you always have maximum at the neutral axis, and then it's going to be decreasing as we go down. 
And that decreasing as it goes down, again, you could look at this uh, cross section and here's your neutral axis. You know, we calculated Q here, we calculated Q the neutral axis. And then, you know, flip the tables where we're like, oh, we want to evaluate um, the shear stress right there. So you draw your horizontal line. You know, you look at, oh, here's my A prime. And initially it starts to seem again like, hey, that's going to gotta be much bigger. How's Q dropping once you get to that neutral axis? But this Q top here is going to be exactly the same as that Q bottom on the other side. And so the Q is maximum at the neutral axis, and that's why your shear stress is going to be higher. So the general shape is a, a curved shape with the given shear stress is going from zero at the edges to max at the neutral. And this is a consistent curve shape because the thickness of our cross-section is constant throughout. Our next example is a common cross-section that we use in design, I-beam. I-beam, the thickness varies. You know, it's got one thickness 200 millimeters in the flange, only 20 millimeters in the web. So we're going to have this continuity in our shear plot there. So what we want to do with this example, uh, we're told the resultant shear force of 20 kilonewtons. We want to evaluate the shear stress at point A, point A being at that junction between flange and the web, and we want to calculate one, what's the shear stress there if we consider it ever so slightly just above that point in the flange. And so the critical thing there is that T is going to be equal to 200 millimeters if it's in the flange. Point B, if we're instead going to evaluate shear stress point A in the web, so it's just differentially slightly offset from that, then T is going to be equal to the web thickness, which is 20 millimeters. For both these locations, because we're just talking about that differential element ever so slightly away from that junction, Q is going to be the same. For both those. So the only distinction between A and B is that thickness. Question C says we want to evaluate where max shear stress is. Where does that occur? Where? Neutral axis. So at neutral axis. And so then lastly, after we get those sort of three data points, we just plot how the shear stress varies on that cross-section. So the general equation, we've got V, Q, all over I, T. So V we're given, I we need to calculate. T is going to vary depending on which element we're calculating. And Q also is going to we'll calculate one Q for point A, one Q for the max shear stress at the neutral axis. Any questions on how to approach the problem before we give you some time to do that?
Okay. Then go ahead and get started.
working on the moment of inertia. Yep. So there are two kind of general approaches for moment of inertia. So the first approach is the general form summation of ix prime plus a dy squared, which is just the parallel axis theorem. And so that always works. You know, to do that one, we kind of divide this into three different sections and do that. There's a second approach that sometimes works. Anyone know that approach? I gross minus I void. When is that valid? So that's valid if centroid of gross and centroid of voids is at same elevation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in this case, um, the let me look at approach two for a minute. Approach two is saying the gross shape is the overall rectangle right here. And so I gross is just dh cubed over 12 of that cross-section. So that cross-section B is 200, H is uh, 340. That's cubed over 12. And the void is saying, okay, these regions right here I'm going to subtract those out so you've got kind of centroid of this void centroid of this void the centroid of the overall gross was right there because they are all occurring in that same horizontal location and that method is valid. So that's going to occur if you have symmetry about the horizontal axis. That's going to be generally a, a valid approach. So let me plug in these terms here. So the for the voids, I've got those sort of two shapes, the 
shape of the one is what is that ninety? Is that B H is three hundred cubed over twelve. I've got two of them. I think I might have a math error there. Two five zero. Uh, what's that? Okay, the two point two five zero. Okay. You can do it uh, either. Uh, you'll need to be consistent with your units. Um, so, general approach is always. Keep it all in millimeters or keep it all in meters. So either is fine. So that's uh, meters to the fourth or uh, what well, is 0 0.250 times 10 to the ninth millimeters to the fourth. So either is fine. So we've got moment of inertia. We've got V, our T. We know for our web or our flange location. So for parts A and B, we've got our cross section. And we're wanting to evaluate it right there at the web. So that's centroid of cross section or neutral axis. Oops, should go the other way, shouldn't it? So, my approach for calculating Q, I draw a horizontal line at the point we're evaluating for shear stress. And then you either have to calculate Q top. Q bottom. In this case, Q top's a little bit easier, right? Because it's a little rectangle. You could calculate either and you'll get the same answer. It doesn't matter which one you do. So A of the top is equal to 200 millimeters times 20 millimeters. 
that's equal to four thousand square millimeters. What is my y bar prime? So that's uh, 150 to the flange and then to the middle of the area, 160 millimeters. So my Q top is equal to A top times Y bar prime. That's my 4,000 millimeters squared times 160 millimeters. So I convert that to meters, 64 meters cubed. Questions about calculating that Q? Okay, so we've got Q then. What's the shear stress in the flange? So part A, V, Q over I, T. So V is 20 kilonewtons. Q we just calculated, 0. 0.00064 meters cubed. I we calculated 0. 0.250 times 10 negative third meters to the fourth. And then T, we've got 200 millimeters, which is... 0.2 meters. So that works out to be 0 0.256 megapascals. So for the shear stress at point A there in the web, everything's the same except for the T. So we've got the same values. Q is the same. And then, uh, the thickness there is 20 millimeters, which is 0 0.02 meters. So 2.56 megapascals. Questions on that? So the last step here for part C, max shear stress. Redraw my cross section. Where's the shear stress maximum? At the neutral axis, right? So here's my horizontal line. So Q top or Q bottom? Symmetry, right? Doesn't really matter. But so we pretty much just break it up. We've got you know, sort of shape one there, shape two here. 
this is where our Q is going to be equal to summation of Y bar prime times A prime. So this is going to be A1. This is going to be A2. Y bar prime 2. Y bar prime 1. So, area 1. We've been doing this in meters, so I'll make my life easier here. I'll write this in meters. So, we've got thickness there, 0.2 meters. Uh, or that's the, the width of the flange, the thickness of the flange, 0 0.02 meters times centroid to the top there. That's our 160 millimeters we did before, 0.16 meters. Plus, for area two, Thickness of it is the web thickness, 0 0.02 meters. Height of that section, 150 millimeters. Times centroid, so the Y bar prime to that distance, which is half the height. So Q of that is 8.65 times 10 to the negative fourth meters to the third. Then shear stress at the neutral axis, 20 kilonewtons, 8.65 times 10 to the negative fourth meters to the third, 0 0.25 to the negative third meters to the fourth. What's the thickness of the neutral axis? 0.02 meters. So that's equal to 3.46 megapascals. So the hard part is calculating Q and just sort of keeping track of all the various values we're calculating. So we're going to build on that on Thursday when we look at shear flow. Yeah. Uh, so part D is going to be plotting these values we just did. Yeah, so um, I mean for this last section, That's okay. Won't take too long. So we evaluated one point in the flange. It was 0 0.256, and then at the same location in the web, it was 2.56. Right here at the neutral axis was 
What is the shear at the top or bottom? Zero. So we've got kind of four data points there. This is a curved line. Then we've got a discontinuous jump because of the change in T. Then we've got a curved line because we've got symmetry about the cross section. Then it's just kind of a mirror image going back down. Yep. Uh, no, if you were to flip this cross section like this. Yeah, like H. And the force was still directed on the middle part of that. That wouldn't, it wouldn't work in that. Uh, moment of inertia does not work here because moment of inertia of the gross, uh, the centroid is there, but you've got a <laughs> void there and a void here. But because we are bending about this horizontal axis, these are at different planes. And so um, I gross minus I void does not work. Okay. Is there a specific reason that it doesn't work with it flipping around like that like in the equation? Well, so these centroids have to line up about the axis that you're so the axis for bending is this horizontal axis, and so they're offset. So it doesn't work. In this case, we're bending about this axis, and those centroids of the gross and the void okay. are on the same elevation. But if you were to have it still bending along that same axis, but have it the other way. If, if the forces you're applying here are in this direction, not this way, Yeah. such that you're bending about this axis, then it's... Okay. Nice. That's what I was thinking, because it didn't okay. seem like anything would be tied to... It's based it, on the direction of the force and like the it's moment. direction of the force and the bending, and then those stacking about the equal axis. Yep. Okay. You had just said elevation. That's why I wasn't sure exactly. Okay. Yeah. But Thanks yeah, for thank clarifying. You. Sure. I know you said um, that you don't want us to have like a sheet for the test because, but would you be like open to letting Um, give me a second person to, to request something. Are you wanting 